Welcome to another episode of The Brand Called You, a podcast and podcast show that brings you leadership lessons, knowledge, experience, and wisdom from thousands of successful individuals from around the world. I am your host, Ashutosh Garg, and today I'm privileged to welcome a well-known and respected author from the world of academia, Emma Sepala. Emma, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Ashutosh. Uh, Emma is the is an author, and all of you know I'm very partial to authors. So she's an author of a book that's coming out in end of April titled Sovereign. She's an author of a book titled The Happiness Track. Emma is also uh, a member of the Yale School of Management faculty, and she's a psychologist. I should have called you Professor Emma Sapala in my introduction. Sorry for that. So Emma, let's uh, let me start by asking you. Tell me a little bit about your own journey uh, and what led up to writing uh, Sovereign. Yes, I mean, my, you know, I grew up in France, um, which sounds really, you know, romantic, but it, it, when I was a child, at least, um, the culture there was, there was a lot of focus on negativity mm. and on a sort of complaint. That's how you bonded with people. And then I moved to the US for college at 17, and I saw that people here were much more positive but they work themselves into the ground. And so there was this burnout culture, anxious mm. culture. Mm. And I lived in China for a couple of years and spent some time also in India. And I, I saw there's people who had very, some people had very little and yet were so grateful on the inside and so resilient. Um, mm. They had something that I felt was like an, an inner wealth. I had, you know, I'd grown up around a lot of outer wealth, but inner poverty, if that makes sense. Mm, people absolutely. who are you know here have so much and yet can be so so um empty on the inside yeah. and then i i saw in china and also india people who had so little and yet who had a sovereign mind had so much wealth internally right. and i went on to uh do a master's in east asian cultures and studied you know indo-tibetan buddhism and and the um the vedas and uh, you know to a certain degree as an as an academic and i thought you know, I wanted to understand more about what brings this inner wealth. And mm. so that brought me to a PhD in psychology mm. um, uh, where I thought, let me see if I can research both the signs of happiness, but also ways in which people can attain more of this inner sovereignty, inner wealth. Right. And um, I ended up doing research on things like meditation, um, yogic breathing practices, um, social connection, compassion, and those kinds of topics um, mm. with people with trauma, but just also everyday people. Yeah. Amazing. Thank you. And what an amazing journey you've had. And, you know, you were talking about uh, how people can be so happy. Many years ago, I was speaking to Dominique Lapierre, who had written um, the book on Calcutta. Uh, and he said that, you know, he had never imagined that people with so little could be so happy. Mm -hmm. So that was fantastic. But now let's come to your book, uh, Sovereign. How do you define the concept of sovereignty in the context of your book? Yeah. So sovereignty in, you know, in brief, it's it's having inner inner freedom but in a sense that that gives you your greatest potential and power. So mm -hmm. what do I mean by that? You know, we talk about mental health and, you know, this idea of, okay, mental health is, is, is not being anxious or depressed. Right. Mm -hmm. And, um, and then you could think of it as, in terms of positive psychology being, um, uh, being also grateful and, and, uh, and, and content and happy and all those things, but mm -hmm. mental sovereignty takes things even further um, into a deeper level of awareness of where we're getting trapped by behaviors, belief systems, addictions, without mm. even realizing it, mm. and how that's keeping us from our greatest potential. And we live in a time and age which is full of distractions. There is so much input. We take in over 60,000 gigabytes of information across all our media platforms every day. Mm -hmm. And that's enough to crash a small computer in a week. We do this daily. Our minds are so cluttered with information but also belief systems that are destructive. I teach mm. very high level senior executives from all over the world at the Yale School of Management. And I often see that the greatest thing standing in their way is their relationship with their own self. Mm. People are highly self-critical, which psychology shows is a type of self-loathing. That's just one example of a belief that, mm. and a, of a, um, a behavior that people have that is 
that is all, everywhere. I mean, so many people have this mm. that it becomes normal. And yet it's very destructive psychologically. It keeps people from showing up as resilient as they could. Mm. And also um, things like addictions, you know, you might think, oh, I'm not an alcoholic. I'm not an addict, but how many people are addicted to, to their technology, to substances, whenever they feel like they don't feel well, they mm. go to substances, to shopping, gambling, working, mm. um, the list goes on. And it keeps us from being free and mental sovereignty, psychological sovereignty is being able to live a life in which you can just like you, Ashutosh, live your fullest potential, your fullest capabilities, because you are not held back by anything that's keeping you bound. Right, right. Very well said. Thank you. And what would you say are some common misconceptions about achieving sovereignty in one's life? Yeah. Yeah. So I wrote my, when I wrote my first book, The Happiness Track, it was because I saw there was a misconception that people felt like in order to be successful, they had to drive themselves into the ground. And when you look at the science, that's just the, the highway to burnout. And that's what we're seeing, you know. Mm. Um, and here with regard to sovereignty, I think a lot of people feel, okay, I'm, I, I have money in the bank. I'm free. Mm. You know, I, I have a job. I'm free. Like I, I have freedom. But the truth is that in a lot of ways, people have, um, are, uh, are not free, are bound to belief systems, to ways of of, uh, of behaving that are actually keeping them bound. For example, um, no matter how many MDs, PhDs, and you know, black belts you have, dishes you know how to cook, most people have as much education about what to do with their big, bad, negative emotions as a five-year-old, which is no formal training. Mm. And so most people are walking around suppressing their negative emotions. Mm. And the research shows that the that the more you suppress emotions, the more you're likely to have negative health outcomes, negative relationship outcomes, negative mental health outcomes. And yet this is what everyone is up to because we haven't received training. And it's so easy then to also get um, addicted to things to help you feel better, whether that's drinking or it's, um, you know, again, there's, the, there's a huge menu available to us out there in the world and a lot of marketing agents intent on having you choose their product to make yourself mm. feel better. Mm. And yet that is how we get, um, we get bound. If right. you look at a child, they experience their emotions fully, you know, they have that tantrum and then it's over. Correct. Anger can last one minute done mm. before an adult. It can last an entire lifetime, keeping them bound, not sovereign. Mm. Well said. And what in your view is the role emotions play in achieving sovereignty? Mm -hmm. Well, let's talk about um, uh, let's talk about the role that emotions can play in a relationship, right? So relationships right. are another area of our life mm -hmm. where we have no toolkit. We're supposed to have good relationships at work in our personal life, and yet no one's ever told us how to do that. Right. And there is research now showing that the most successful leaders are mm -hmm. the ones who are able to, when interacting with others, mm -hmm. have a life supportive relationship a life-giving relationship. So some colleagues of mine found that in organizations, there were groups of people that were hyper productive. Right. When they looked a little closer, they found there was one individual at the core of that group mm -hmm. that was like an, a battery energizing everyone around mm -hmm. them. How did they do that? And we all know people who drain us, right? When we're mm -hmm. with them, we feel drained yeah. after. But there are these people, other people who are energy enhancers. How mm -hmm. do they do that? Mm -hmm. Everybody wants to feel seen, heard, valued, and appreciated. And those positive energizers are able to do that. Mm. How? Because they have values like compassion, kindness, forgiveness, humility, integrity, honesty. Mm. And not just that, but they also have the ability to fill their own tank. Mm. So, so many of us are walking around our lives drained, burnt out, pushing the envelope, just drinking more coffee, just yeah. pushing through without yeah. any regard for our physical or mental well-being, mm. without recharging our own batteries. And yet if we're able to do that, then we're able to show up more emotionally balanced mm. with our values and able to have this life supportive relationship with others, which creates hyper, not just hyper productivity, but hyper mm. well-being around mm. you. And that's how you create culture, community. That's how you really uh, attain high levels of leadership as mm. well. Mm. Well said. And what, in your view, is the significance of intuition mm -hmm. um, in understanding sovereignty? So many of us have been taught to just be rational, logical, and reasonable, which we do, and which is a very good thing to, to yeah. know yeah. how to be. That's what we learn in school. Mm -hmm. And we learn to poo-poo and set aside any gut mm -hmm. feelings or intuitions as something like magical thinking. Mm -hmm. And yet, you know, we know people who have, for example, my friend Kushal, he was in the Twin Towers during 9-11. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. And the guard said, stay in the building. Everybody stay in the building. And Kushal had this gut feeling he should run and he mm. ran and he saved his life by a hair that wow. day. Mm. We've all had intuitions. And think about if Kushal had not listened to it, had pushed mm. it aside as magical thinking or pushed mm. it aside because I should do what everybody else is doing. Mm. He would have lost his life that day. Right. We know from research that intuition, just like instincts and animals are designed to save our life and guide us. Mm. And neuroscience shows that when you're making a very complicated decision, weighing a lot of options, you make a better decision if you go with your gut feeling mm -hmm. as opposed to trying to think through all the details. Mm. And the military in the U.S. has been studying intuition for decades and continues to do so because of mm -hmm. how many soldiers have come back from war, mm -hmm. um, having reported that they saved their own or others' lives mm -hmm. because of a gut feeling. Correct. Correct. Well said. Well said. And uh, what would you say is the role of vulnerability in achieving sovereignty? You know, one of our greatest needs after food and shelter is positive mm -hmm. social connection with other people. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And yeah, and oftentimes we think we have to put on airs or look a certain way or speak a certain way or fit in mm -hmm. in order to connect. And yet, how do we feel when we're around someone who puts on airs mm -hmm. or looks too perfect? Do we feel connected? Not really, mm -hmm. right? And we can definitely tell when someone's being inauthentic. The funny yeah. thing is when you're being inauthentic or you're trying to put on a show, mm -hmm. people can see through it. We can, mm. we know when people are inauthentic and the reason is that we're physiologically wired to resonate with one another. Mm. So for example, if I'm frowning, it, it activates the micro muscles for frowning in your mm. face, right? Mm. We're constantly mirroring. If I'm hiding anger, if I'm angry, but I'm hiding it, your heart rate goes up. Your intellect hasn't caught on, but your body's right. already caught on that something yeah. fishy is going on, something yeah. inauthentic. Mm. But around vulnerability, around authenticity, what happens is you relax mm. because there's um, inauthenticity registers mm. as threat mm. physiologically. Authenticity, when someone is authentic and vulnerable, we relax mm. and we're able to really and deeply connect. And sometimes leaders will think, well, if I'm vulnerable, I'll look weak. The opposite is true. When you can own up to your own humanity, which means yep. that there are good days and there are days which are hard, mm. everyone around you feels more connected to you and feels um, that they too have, have the permission to be human. Mm. And that's where we have the deepest connection. I'll, 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 with one example, I can show this. Um, if you can think back on a time in your life where there was someone who was there for you, it could have been a mentor in childhood, in adulthood, someone who saw you for who you are with all of your potential, mm. wanting nothing in return, except mm. just supporting. Can you right. think of someone like that, Ashutosh? Absolutely. Many. Yeah. Mm. So what's interesting to me, if this person were to text you right now in the middle of our conversation and say, I have an urgent matter, please call me right now. Would you drop everything and call them? I probably would. Yes. Yeah. So that is loyalty. Do you see? That's loyalty. And when you think about how companies try to command loyalty, mm. it's through financial rewards or bonuses or yeah. things like that. But that means the company next door mm. can purchase them. That's not loyalty. That's... That can that that can be bought, right? Mm. But the loyalty between you and this person who is your mentor mm. is priceless and no money was ever exchanged. And yet it is a loyalty that was born out of this deep human connection with another Correct. person Correct. that you will never forget. Correct. And that is how we that is how we connect at our most mm. deepest and intimest. Mm. What a powerful example you've given. Thank you. And I'm sure a lot of our viewers and listeners can do the same check within their own lives on uh, who made them feel uh, secure and who was there for them. Fantastic. Uh, my next question is, Emma, how does your book address the challenge of maintaining sovereignty in the face of adversity or chaos? So there's, you know, very little we can do about external matters, right? Okay. Chaos yeah. happens on a routine basis, whether yeah. in our own lives mm -hmm. or on the planet. In fact, it's happening right now. And we, as we saw in the pandemic, when all that happened, we had total loss of control of external matters. Okay. However, there is one thing that we can maintain control over, and mm -hmm. that is the state of our own mind. Mm -hmm. That's that inner wealth, inner sovereignty I was talking about earlier. And through practices like breathing, like meditation, like mm. unplugging, like spending time in nature, like spending time in contemplation mm. or, or listening to wisdom, engaging with wisdom, there's so much junk food media out there, right? But when you engage with wisdom, that is, those are all things that cultivate a sovereign state of mind. And when you have a sovereign state of mind, mm. 
it doesn't matter what's happening on the outside. Mm. You're still going to show up as your best. You know, we've all had situations that are triggering. For example, for myself, I know that when my children are screaming at the top of their lungs, mm. it triggers my nervous system. Mm. But there are some days where I feel triggered and there are other days, same situation. I'm not triggered at all. Mm. What's the difference? We've all had these experiences. It's when we've cultivated that inner sovereignty. And that's something we do have control over. Um, and our research shows that, you know, breathing practices um, like sky breath meditation, which is um, a breathing practice stems out of India, actually, mm. um, through the art of living. Yeah. Um, but also practices like meditation, different forms of meditation can really help uh, like loving kindness meditation, which is a Buddhist practice, are ways that we can really cultivate that inner sovereignty, uh, no matter what's going on on the outside. Mm. Mm. Well said. Can you also talk to me a little bit about the importance of self-compassion in the journey towards sovereignty? Absolutely. So when I talk to executives, when I teach executives and I ask how many people are self-critical, 90 mm -hmm. to 95% of people raise their hand. Mm -hmm. And from a psychological standpoint, self-criticism is a form of self-loathing which is really dramatic when you think about it, that 90 to 95% of people are walking around with self-loathing. 80% of millennials endorse the idea, I am not good enough with regards to almost every area of their life. Mm. That is profoundly disempowering. Mm -hmm. And then, so if I often have, do this exercise where I ask people to think back on the last time they made an embarrassing mistake or a, or a big a big boo-boo, right? Something uh, mm. uh, embarrassing, something they, that they wish they hadn't done. Mm. What were the words that they said to themselves in that moment? Most mm. of the time, people will say, I'm so stupid. I don't mm. belong here. Mm. And the list goes on. You know, when you see the list of things people say, it's really heartbreaking. Mm. But if you ask them, well, what would you say to your best friend who just made the same mistake? Mm. They'll say, everyone makes mistakes. Yeah. It's no big deal. You've got this. Mm. Um, and, and these kind of reaffir reaffirming compassionate words. Mm. What is the difference between you and your best friend? Mm. The only difference is that you live in different bodies. Mm. There is no difference. Correct. And what the research shows is that when we're highly self-critical, the result is more anxiety, more depression, less uh, willingness to try again, fear of failure, the opposite of resilience. Mm. But when people are more self-compassionate, they have better mental health, they have better physical health, they have better sleep, mm. they have better relationships with other people. Mm. Because when you're hard on yourself, you're also going to be hard on the people that you love the most and want to hurt the mm. least, right? Mm. So self-compassion is the only thing that makes sense. It doesn't make sense to have a toxic relationship with yourself. That's right. not how you're going to show up at your most powerful. Right. But you are going to show up at your most powerful when you've not kicked your way onto the battlefield of your life. Mm. loved your way onto the battlefield of your mm. life arriving strong fully armed fully uh, fully in full potential well said and uh, is this also something where an imposter syndrome tends to come in when you are self-critical absolutely imposter syndrome is basically this idea that i don't belong here i'm not smart enough i'm mm. not good enough right mm. and it is a toxic belief mm. and it's not true right. who's to say you don't belong somewhere correct Correct. Correct. Well said. So uh, moving on, what practices would you recommend to someone looking to strengthen their own sovereign self? Yeah, absolutely. So I have an equation for sovereignty that I put together as I was writing my book. Mm. One is awareness mm -hmm. plus courage plus a full tank. Mm. So breaking that down, awareness is something that you can cultivate. We, we have uh, attention networks in our brain that are focused on the outward. We're always, you know, tasting, smelling, touching, and so forth. Mm. But there's an attention network in our brain that is dedicated to paying attention on the inside. Mm. That is awareness, self-awareness. Mm. But then you have awareness of the outside world. And you can cultivate that and you can strengthen that neural pathway for self-awareness mm. through meditation. Meditation is a key practice. Mm. However, if there's a lot of anxiety, meditation can be very challenging at first. Mm. And that's also where breathing comes in. So the sky breath meditation is something we researched with veterans with trauma mm. for whom meditation could not even be considered given how much anxiety there was. And right. that is a really profound way to cultivate the resilience and calmness through your nervous system, so that then your mind is able to be calmer and meditate. So breathing exercises, um, meditation, um, and also 
spending time in contemplation and unplugged, we know that when the brain is in alpha wave mode, which is when it's relaxed, it's in a meditative state, mm -hmm. it's not actively focused on your screen, mm -hmm. it's not passed out on the couch, right? It's in that in-between space. That's when you're most likely to come up with your aha moments and mm -hmm. insights and intuitions. Mm -hmm. So that's awareness. Those are some practices. Spending time in nature also, these kind of contemplative activities. And then, um, and I, I, for people who are religious, I think throwing prayer in there is, yeah. and, and, you know, that is going to also be part of that. And then the courage, that is something that is also cultivated. Mm -hmm. You know, it sometimes can feel very scary to do something and pushing yourself to do it. Mm -hmm. Every time you do it, that fear is going to start to diminish in its power over you. Mm -hmm. Because when fear has power over you, you're not sovereign. So you have to actively cultivate courage until it becomes second nature. And it does mm. because fear can no longer control you. And then a full tank and a full tank is making sure to also with your self-awareness, realize where am I at today? Where's my body at? Where's my mind? Do I need rest? Do I need proper food? What do I need? And keeping that in check, because when we're in a, with a full tank, we can show up very powerfully, but when we're drained, we're going to um, be de-energized. We're, we're not going to be able to show up with our full mm -hmm. sovereign self. And now the full tank is not always possible. Say you work three jobs, you've got three kids, mm -hmm. you don't sleep at night. That's very difficult. Mm -hmm. But what I always say is in those moments that you have during the day, even if it's five minutes at the end of the day, when everybody's gone to sleep and you have five minutes for yourself, mm -hmm. what do you choose to do? Something draining, like doom scrolling, or are you going to sit and meditate? Are you going to sit and breathe? Are you going to sit and put your hands on your heart and give yourself some love, whatever it is? Mm -hmm. Well said. That's cultivating, filling your tank, cultivating sovereignty. Mm, well said. Thank you. Great response. So time for two more questions. How does societal or cultural conditioning impact our ability to be sovereign? And how can we tackle this? Absolutely. So there are so many ways in which we take in messages from the outside that we don't even realize are destructive. Right. right? For example, this idea that you always have to be in go, go, go mode mm -hmm. when you're working. In order to get things done, you have to be high on caffeine and in go, go, go mode. Well, actually, we know that just means you're going to burn out more quickly, Correct. right? But everybody's doing it, so we don't question it. That's just mm -hmm. one example, right? Mm -hmm. Another one is this self-loathing, self-criticism idea that it's okay for us to um, be self-critical, but not okay for us to praise ourselves, for example. Mm -hmm. Why not? What, what, why is that? that? That's social conditioning. Um and for example, if you're if you engage with news media, you'll see a lot of it is very negative. And so if you're taking that in all the time, mm. you're bringing all this negative uh, fear based mindset into your mind. Now, mm. we know journalists will tell you this, that their job is to trigger your stress response in order to get you to click right. on the article and then click on the ads. Right. I mean, journalists will tell you this is no secret. Mm. But if we're constantly and without awareness taking it in, then mm. we can think, wow, the world is going to hell in a handbasket mm. and everybody's mm. dangerous and I need to stay home and <laughs> be in fear all the time, mm. right? So mm. there are many, many messages coming our way, both constructive and not constructive. The idea is to be aware what's serving me, what's not. So anyone who's been to a different culture, whether you go to a different country or maybe a different city within your own country, right? It's a different culture wherever you go. When you go in a different culture, and you see that things are people are doing things differently, you realize, oh, I can do things differently too, right? Yep. When I came from France to the US and I realized in the US people are not so negative, I thought, wow, you know what? They do things differently here and I like it better. Mm -hmm. You get the option of making a different choice for yourself. Right. And what I'm recommending here is to question messaging and conditioning that's coming your way that's mm -hmm. not serving you. Mm -hmm. And if it's not serving you, doing it differently. Mm -hmm. That's sovereignty. Well said. And my last question to you, Emma, how do you hope your book Sovereign will change the conversation around personal freedom and power? To me, this book, it's heavily backed by science, but it's also a love letter. Yeah. It's a love letter to humanity. Hmm. I hope that this book is going to open people's eyes to the ways in which without realizing they are standing in the way of their own potential hmm. and that they have it in their hands that they have it in their own, uh, within reach to free themselves from the many ways that they are binding themselves so mm. that they can live a life of sovereignty. 70% mm. of people on their deathbed regret not living the life they wanted to live, not making the choices they wish they had. Mm. Let's not be one of those. Mm. 
Wonderful. Because every human has so much potential and has such unique gifts that if everyone is able to live in the fullest expression of themselves in their life, this planet is going to be a much, much better place. Absolutely. Very well said. And on that note, Emma, and your, your, your love letter to humanity that you've just spoken about, thank you so much for speaking to me about your own amazing journey. Thank you for speaking to me about your book, Sovereign. We covered a lot of ground on different aspects of sovereignty and how to handle emotions, how to handle negativity, how to handle positivity, how to handle our normal day-to-day -day lives. I'm going to ask all our viewers and listeners to go and check out Professor Emma Sipala's book, which is going to be released in end of, in end of uh, April. And uh, I'm going to check it out myself as well. Thank you so much for speaking to me and all the very best to you. Thank you so much, Ashutosh, for having me. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the brand called You Videocast and Podcast, a platform that brings you knowledge, experience and wisdom of hundreds of successful individuals from around the world. Do visit our website www.tbcy.in to watch and listen to the stories of many more individuals. You can also follow us on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram and Twitter. Just search for the brand called You.